So we do a huge amount of communication, trying to get people involved and aware of issues around open access. And we have to make special mention of some people that help us put things into the university repository. Uh, we have four open access assistants, uh, research repository assistants, who help us deposit and meet the requirements of all the open access policies that we've got there. Right. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm part of the data facility. And the purpose of today is to tell you a little bit about the data sharing that we support, as well as the Office of Scholarly Communication. So what is about the data management and data sharing? So as Arthur told you a little bit about the funder mandates to make the articles, the PDF of a paper, which describes the results, openly available. Now there are also new mandates, which require that researchers also share the supporting research data. So it's not only the PDF of the paper, but whatever analysis led the researcher to decide that we make this claim should be also made openly available. So that's why we have started the research data services at Cambridge. And just to tell you a little bit about those services, what do they consist of? First of all, we have a lot of online information. So there is this data website, hopefully a one-stop shop for all the researchers' questions. So they don't have to email everybody. If they are really curious, they want to find the answer about something, they just go in there, they get information about funders' policies, about good data management, about what should I do to make my data available. Then we also do loads of policy development, and that's quite important. You know, we shouldn't be just receiving whatever funders tell us, you must be doing this. It's very important that Cambridge is part of these discussions with funders that will lead in policy development. So we did a lot of discussions with funders where we invited them over to Cambridge to have discussions directly with researchers, and this is quite important, that there is no disjoint between funders and researchers whom are actually affected by the policy. So that's all within admin blog posts. We have also coordinated a joint UK-wide response to a concordat on open research data that was done by us in Cambridge. You can have a look at the blog post. We also help funders and researchers and reviewers to have some standards on data management plan preparation, which is part of the grant application. So basically helping researchers to be successful in getting money for their research. And also currently we're also trying to influence journals' data policies. So what is the requirement for data sharing? Likewise, we are also supporting researchers in sharing their data. So we run a data repository and as you can see, since we started in 2015, we have massive influx of the amount of data being shared in the repository, from 72 to about 800 nowadays. So in two years, we got more data sets than in 10 years since the creation of this space. As I mentioned before, we help researchers with grant preparation to make sure that the good data management practice is embedded from the very start of the grant application. And we also do loads of training. And Rosie and Lauren will be telling you a little bit more about the training and the techniques that we are using. And finally, we also do loads of advocacy and outreach. And Dani will be telling you a bit more about our strategies in there. And just to tell you and advertise our services, we have these wonderful postcards which basically tell researchers everything they need to know about data sharing. And you can find more of those at the very end of the room. And the final information from me is also, each university within the UK, they started creating their own repositories for research data. And at some point we realized, you know, with like changing landscape, that this is not so sustainable. Like, come on, if we have 100 universities in the UK, or maybe more, I don't know how many do we have, it's a bit crazy that each one of us have to have their own data repository and manage all these deposits, support innovation, help researchers present the data better. So Cambridge joined a UK-wide initiative together with some other 13 UK universities, including Imperial College London, to develop a better repository to basically help supporting researchers with sharing data in the 21st century. So for example, make the data easier discoverable, make them better citable, make them more visible and more dynamically displayed. So that's an exciting project and we are hoping to <coughs> drive the innovation in the UK overall. So I work with Marta okay. on the research data team um, and as the research data advisor. As a result of all of the training that we've done and the massive success that there has been in the uptake in our training, um, we realised we couldn't actually meet that demand between the two of us. So our approach to this has been to reach out to the research community and ask for volunteers to become data champions. <coughs> the data champions are researchers, PhD students or staff who are happy to advocate for research data management in their departments. So I think there's a couple of people in the audience who are actually involved in the project who are librarians who are data champions. 
uh, but we also have a lot of researchers. And the idea is that they will deliver training within their departments, so using their disciplinary knowledge to be able to deliver more specific training, um, and that they'll also form a community of practice, so they can talk to each other about any issues they're having, exchange best practice in data management. So we put out a call um, in September and said, any volunteers? And we're very pleasantly surprised by the response that we got. So we had 44 applicants across 27 departments and five of the schools. Unfortunately, the Arts and Humanities are still need to be convinced that they have data. So we've got some work to do there, but this has been really successful. Um, the graph just shows a mix of who we have. So uh, we've got a large chunk of PhD students, a lot of postdocs are interested in this. But we've also got some PIs and they're really useful in providing <coughs> leadership for the project and helping the younger members and the less experienced members to grow their skills and grow their confidence. Um, so what we've done with our data champions so far is we've had a welcome meeting. Uh, we ran two, one centrally, one at Addenbrooke to try and engage people. And we recently also started running some presentation training so the more junior members can sort of gain their confidence in presenting skills. We've got a Moodle website. We have uh, part of the data website is also a list of data champions. So if you want to find out who the person to talk to in a relevant area is, you can go and talk to them. And we've got another meeting planned with all of our champions in March. I should also say that this has been uh, attracted quite a lot of interest from other UK universities. We're the first people to try this. Um, as a result of us saying that we're trying this, a couple of other universities are looking at it. And there's also been some interest from um, various European partners that we have who are looking at something similar. So hopefully this will be a growing area. So I'll hand over to Claire. So you've heard a lot about what we do for the researchers in the research community. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm sure you're sick of the sight of me now because I've been doing so many training sessions. But I'm Claire and I look after the sort of training for librarians in this rapidly growing area. So we have two main programmes and I quite often get asked what the difference is between them so I thought I'd use my time to explain that. On the left hand side, supporting researchers in the 21st century is if you like the overarching programme or the training that we offer to the library community. And we hope by doing that that we can upskill you in whatever way to learn about these areas. You can get as involved as you like. You can attend one or two sessions. You can drop back, step in, however it works for you. Last year we ran over 30 sessions and we were also pleasantly surprised to find that was nearly 500 staff members. Obviously some of these are going to be repeat members, but I still think that's important in getting the message out there. Also pleasantly just surprised to discover that 71% thought the sessions were excellent. Yay. <laughs> Obviously all the bribery with donuts has worked. I very nearly did just put donut pictures on this slide. But on the uh, right hand side of the slide we have the Research Support Ambassador Programme. So that is run once a year. At the moment it's from the summer till about the end of the year that we're still working out how we're going to tweak it for 2017. And that's your more in-depth group of volunteers. So these are people that want to have some some real key knowledge about scholarly communication, different areas like open access, research data management, whatever it might be. And you can see we take horrendous pictures of you when you graduate. There is one of me, I don't know if you can see me in the middle of that one there, so I don't escape it either. But this has been a very good education experience for me and I hope a very good education experience for the people that participated. They seem to have got something out of it. If anyone wants more information, there's my poster from the Libraries at Cambridge conference at the back. Basically what we ask is for volunteers to come along, you'll do some in-depth training with various experts and various people we get in, you'll do some group project work and you'll hopefully develop lots of skills along the way. So that's the end of my sales pitch, and I'll pass over to Lauren. Hello, I'm Lauren, uh, I'm going to explain a bit about the, the training that we've been providing for uh, the research community. Uh, last year we really tried to increase the amount of training we were doing and vary the amount of training. So we started a session of PhD training programmes and there are two kind of parallel sessions that run, one for STEM students and one for arts and humanities and social science students, so that they get uh, information that is tailored towards them and their discipline. And we run those termly, now I think there are about six to eight sessions depending on which stream you're in. Uh, and they have been very well attended, very well booked, and we vary the locations around Cambridge to make them accessible to the students to really give them an idea of an overview of scholarly communication from everything to that kind of how to pick your journal to dealing with copyright and managing your data and then sharing your work afterwards. We also run a lot of 
one-off sessions. There are a lot of data sessions and workshops that we run throughout the year. But we also run larger sessions that can be from half a day to a full day. Some of them are dedicated to things like electronic lab notebooks, so people can come and learn about different providers and how they might use uh, these different author tools. Some of them are more general sessions, such as helping researchers publish, where we invite outside speakers to talk about the different tools that they can offer researchers to help make their lives a bit easier when they're writing and sharing their research. We've also uh, held some big sessions about open research with researchers or kind of any staff members across Cambridge to find out how they feel about open research and what they would like the university to do about it and how we can support them. So we're really taking a bottom-up approach, making sure we respond to researchers' needs. The other exciting thing that happened last year is we finally got put onto the UTBS university <laughs> training system so that now all our training can be advertised in one coherent place and we're part of the university kind of training <coughs> system as a whole. I'll pass on to Peter. the repository as it's known sometimes and also just help out with service development. So um, DSpace or the repository has been around for about a decade in Cambridge. I think when it was first it was <coughs> thought of as being like a good thing but I think it's pretty fair to say that the initial the initial appearance of kind of a bit clunky wasn't the nicest thing to look at. It wasn't a really good experience to use. Um, and I think with the ambitions that the university has, it was important that we built on DSpace to provide a service um, and an experience for users that's actually positive. So, you know, as it was, it was kind of an obstacle for people to actually share their data or share their research, whereas we wanted it to be something that's very easy to use and more importantly, makes it very easy for people to find the research on it. So, it was relaunched and renamed, renamed as Apollo. Still gets called the repository, still gets called DSpace sometimes, but Apollo really is the name of the service, and DSpace is just like the technical platform that sits underneath. So you can call it the same thing, it doesn't really matter, but DSpace isn't the only repository software out there, so it may be a, a dreaded point in the future, some point where we take it away and use something else. <coughs> and this calling it Apollo lets us kind of maintain continuity with. Um, with the actual <coughs> it's still on the active <coughs> development, so um, it's going to be improved as often as we can. It's improved um, every day. I think uh, you'll hear more about the actual improvements a later on. Um, one of the most important things that has been added to Apollo is a request to copy service. So the university has a has um, has a, a, insist that when you uh, when you have a, an article accepted for publication, you deposit it on acceptance. So that's the policy. Rather than waiting until it's been published, which can often be a kind of a one or two year gap between being accepted for <coughs> publication and actually being published, because that makes um, lets the research become available straight away. And there's a big demand, as we can see from the request to copy service, which my colleague will talk about a bit later on but people want to see the research. Um, so apart from the time delay, open access also often stipulates an embargo period. So you might have to wait, say, a year or two years before you can actually make it fully open access. But this lets interested parties and the authors get in contact with each other and share unpublished research in a way that doesn't um, breach kind of copyright laws and doesn't become systematic sharing of research which would be illegal. Hello, uh, I'm Maria. I work in the Open Access team and um, I wanted to show you how well, you, how well used our repository is, not only <coughs> locally, regionally, but also internationally. You can see the dark blue areas and the lighter blue areas, so it is fairly well used. And before I show you the most popular cities, which I think it's quite interesting to know, uh, just a glimpse of our Google statistics. Um, for the month of November 2016, and I picked this month only because December is not the most representative month due to the 
holidays. So we had more than 90, 33 page views by 22,000 unique users, which is quite impressive if you think that last November, in November 2015, we had almost half. This month we had an increase of 45%. And where do our visitors come from? Well, uh, nearly 60% of the visits come from the UK, China, and the US, <coughs> and uh, followed by other countries, such as Germany, India, Canada, and I will not recite everything. But popular cities include, apart from Cambridge, obviously, uh, London, Beijing, Shanghai, Oxford, New York, Sydney, and there are lots of Asian cities that I can't even pronounce, so we will not attend it. <laughs> But also our repository is very well used within our community. And uh, as you can start to realize from our work, we have already created over 7,000 DOIs, um, 800 data sets and more have been uploaded. And my mistake, not submitted, but we have almost 11,000 articles that we deposited in our repository. And since I started working here, I think that's a very, very impressive number because it takes between 15 minutes at the best to one hour to deposit one article, uh, depending on the complexity of the article, how much you have to research. Um, and <coughs> some more statistics, but from what you can see in our small team, uh, the success of these numbers create a backlog, which kindly I think Arthur mentioned, with over 600 items waiting to be submitted, so that's about 500 hours, <laughs> and uh, almost 2,500 items that have been already deposited waiting to be updated. Because, as my colleague said, uh, Peter, I think, when we um, put an article in our depository, there are embargoes, um, manuscripts that need to be uh, corrected to final version, so somebody has to do that. So there are currently about 2,500 items waiting for somebody to be changed and updated. So, and that's it. And I'm Kostan. Hello, I'm Kostan Amatole. How is the student of the Peter has mentioned, uh, mentioned a little bit about the repository upgrade and the, brand, the renaming uh, of Apollo. So in addition to that, We've also automated the workflows for depositing open access articles and data sets. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. I would like to first um, show you the systems that uh, we had to use with the previous workflow, tell you a bit more about the issues uh, with those systems, and lastly I will then say uh, what we have done to address uh, these issues. So in terms of systems uh, that researchers and the open access and data teams have to deal with, first they have to split their accepted articles are uh, into the open access website. Then they have to, uh, as Marta mentioned, our funders require now to uh, submit also associated data sets with publications, so for that, researchers have to then interact with another system, they have to use the data website. And then on top of that, as if it wasn't enough, uh, they also have to deal with red submissions and uh, use symplectic elements for that, where they can add and claim publications and then link them to our research grants for our funders reporting. So uh, this often costs that all of the information that they've sent to us already via the open access website for the publication, <coughs> they have to then manually enter it again uh, in another system. So, so far, uh, three systems that researchers have uh, used, and yet we haven't deposited anything to the repository. Now is when the open access data teams uh, take over, and what we do then, as Maria mentioned, they have to manually process um, each of the submissions and then deposit them in the repository. So this is a, a very complex and quite time-consuming workflow. And as well as that, they have to update more than 2,000 articles once they are published. So in a nutshell, or as a summary, so four different systems completely disconnected that researchers, the open access and data team need to be working with. That causes a big problem for researchers because they don't have a single access point for their publications and also managing our grants and are reporting, they have the various reporting they have to be doing. And then in terms of the teams, uh, very, very time consuming uh, processing times, and uh, that often causes delays. And in the end of the day, the key thing is to try and make their publications and data openly available as, as quicker as possible. So what we've done 
to help them with that is uh, we've integrated the repository Apollo with synthetic elements. So this way now, researchers have a single system where they can enter, manage all the publications, and then the key benefits are we get an automatic straight away Apollo deposit in the repository. Uh, so basically now the open access and data teams only need to review those submissions and approve them. So we also have uh, enhanced reporting because before having uh, been able to report in terms of open access compliance across the entire university, it was very difficult with the previous systems because we didn't have all of the information we needed into a single system. So with this now, all of the information is available in Simplecti, so in theory, we are hoping, we will get uh, better ways of reporting on those as well. And lastly, uh, very important, researchers get enhanced visibility of their output because, as I said, they are made openly available faster, and also we get uh, automatic updates for the repository records uh, via Simplecti. So that means the repository records are always up to date. And then lastly, as a bonus, it's also very important, we get ORCID integration. Um, because this information is coming from Synthetic and we have it now already uh, available in the repository. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Sorry. Yes, I'm Matthias, for those of you who don't know me. Um, in addition to being the project coordinator and therefore trying to keep an overview of all these things that my colleagues have talked about, um, I'm also working on the dissemination of research side of things, uh, mainly on the type of literature that doesn't fall under the open access mandates. Um, that isn't covered by that. So one of this is PhD theses, because a lot of the research that happens in Cambridge ends up in PhD theses. Um, and unfortunately, they're not very easily available. You either have to go to the manuscript reading room here, um, or you need to order them specially and have them digitized. Um, and so what we're trying to do is improve access to the Cambridge PhD theses. Um, in the, again, through the repository. Um, at the moment, we have 2,200 theses available in the repository. Um, as you can see, half of which are available openly to the public. Um, the other half are available through the requested copy function that Peter talked about. So that will then be referred either to the author, if it's under embargo, or to the digital content unit here in the library. Um, we need to ask each author for explicit permission to make these openly available, which is why um, not all of them are um, available in that way. Um, but at least they're more discoverable. You can find, the, find them through Google, find the abstract, um, and so on. So, and in order to increase the number, we're currently running a project with the British Library who are digitizing 1,400 theses. Um, they have a microfilm, which should be ready hopefully in the next couple of months to be uh, added to the repository. Um, and another exciting thing that we're doing is the digital thesis pilot, which uh, we're starting very soon, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, fingers crossed, um, with eight departments to start with. Um, and what we're trying to do is basically capture everyone who submits a PhD thesis uh, in this academic year to also upload a copy to the repository in addition to the hardbound version they submit to the university library with a view to rolling this out across the whole university in the future. Um, and we have made the thesis deposit form, which will hopefully make the user experience of doing that um, a bit easier. At the moment you have to email a copy of the thesis and a copy of the license agreement to the repository. Um, hopefully this will just be easier. It's a fairly standard online form uh, where you get all the information and you automatically then click on accepting the agreements that go with it. And yeah, hopefully that will make the user journey a bit more simple. Um, something else is publishing, as I say, other kinds of literature. There's lots of what's called grey literature being produced within the university. So things that don't normally go through peer review or even peer review journals that are published by departments themselves. But that, that includes things like working papers in education, economics and so on, technical reports in engineering, <coughs> uh, lecture series, student journals and so on and so forth. Um, again, there's an accessibility issue and a preservation issue with some of these. Some of them are available in print, posted on their own websites, which are then uh, often revamped and things fall off the internet and so on and so forth. So we're in the process of developing a variety of services to enable the capture and the preservation of that because it's all part of the research output of the university and we think that should be um, accessible as such. Um, one of the case studies which we've already worked with is the Cambridge Journal of China Studies, which originally looked like this. So it was a print uh, journal. It had an online presence but was hosted on a very rickety website. Um, the people who were publishing it didn't know about indexing in um, search engines, etc., um, or about giving them permanent digital identifiers. 
So this is now, while, while they're still producing the printed copy, it is now also hosted in the repository, which, is, which you can see on, on the screen. It's one collection, the Chem Journal of China Studies, and each article, as you can see there, hopefully now has a permanent a DOI, which is permanent and which will always link to that article. Um, so there's more to come in that way, we hope. Um, but that's what I'm working on, and I'll pass over to Tim Unfortunately, our team has been struck down over the last week, so um, I'm going to be Hannah for the purposes of this uh, this bit. Um, so she's given me some notes, um, so I will say what she what she was going to say. Um, so uh, we're very out and proud uh, in terms of outreach. We're very very active in in our work. Um, nearly 100% of what we do involves some sort of communication outside the group. Um, and we, we promote our scholarly communications by being transparent and actively building our networks both within the university and externally. So in terms of community engagement, uh, we talk obviously to researchers as we've described, from press grad, uh, grads to the heads of department, but we also maintain networks with the li within the libraries here locally in Cambridge and beyond, and with research support staff. And we also want to bring about improvements. So we, we are in, actively engaged in the senior university staff and uh, senior university staff and the committee structure with that. Um, we talk a lot to publishers um, and also providers of research technical tools, so author tools that help researchers actually do their jobs and uh, to write. So here's an example of a couple of things that we're, projects we're doing. One is um, the joined up communications group. So what we've got is researchers who are being communicated to, usually, not with, um, by different uh, departments in the university. So the Research Information Office, the Research Strategy Office, the Research Operations Office. Our group, the open access side of things, the research data management side of things, the communication office it may or may not say, do you want to promote your, this particular published research? They might be getting information from all sorts of different places that often sounds kind of similar. And there's confusion about what they need to do, when they need to do it. Often it's just, oh, just overload, and I don't even read it because it's all too much. So we need to do something about this, about standardising the language and standardising the means of communication across the university. This is something of a revolution in Cambridge to actually get different areas of administration to 